Welcome back to another ConCon Virtual 2020 session. Um, today we've got Sam from Vonage with us. Um, I've known Sam for quite a while now. Um, he always likes to kind of join things together and, and hack on things and make things work that should never have worked together at all. Um, so I'm just going to pass you over to Sam, um, who's going to talk to us about Asterisk, uh, the ARI, um, and Node-RED, um, this really cool bit of software that lets you do loads of nifty things. Um, and I'll catch up with you and Sam afterwards. Cheers. OK, thanks, Dan. Um, yeah, and I don't know about that. Uh, things that shouldn't go together. I call it innovation. Some people call it things that shouldn't be bolted together. But uh, anyway, yeah. So as Dan said, my name is Sam Machin. I'm a uh, product manager for Vonage these days, uh, but I was a developer advocate before that. And I've been hacking with telecoms and things for the best part of 20 years. Uh, my first job was climbing towers and uh, working on the radio network for Orange. So definitely full stack communications uh, engineer. Um, so the thing I want to talk to you today about, um, it doesn't really have a name um, yet, but uh, I'm, so I've kind of called it visual asterisk and, and hopefully you'll see where I'm going um, with this. Um, really, this, is, this talk is about uh, the coming together of two trends, two things that I've seen kind of emerging in technology, development, programming, um, communications and, and that sort of space. Uh, first of all, though, I need to give you a warning. Um, this is the under construction and i can really show how old i am because some of you may remember the under construction pages on the web um this whole project if you would call it that um idea concept is is a work in progress um it started off at uh tad hack virtual uh wherever the orlando one was that so that was just uh just the start of lockdown kind of uh, end of march um it's an idea that i've been kicking around in my head but i had that weekend to to play with it and kind of build a very very rough prototype and i've developed it a little bit from there but you know this is really some ideas some questions quite a lot of questions i've got um wondering about is this something that kind of would be a thing does it make sense um would we you know is it worth developing on what should it look like so uh you know i'll be using this as a virtual talk but i'd really like people to join us for the q a that we're going to do um after the after the showing um and and give me some feedback tell me what you think um tell me if you think i'm being stupid and this is the worst idea ever or if this is something that interests you um i think some of the code is kind of on my github repo um or if not i, can, I will put it up there but uh, it's all very rough and you know it's kind of at the stage where i'm trying something and then going down a going down a path and having to delete it all and start again so the two trends um the first one is programmable communications and I did this is a last minute change I was kind of also talking about this as being um, configuration as code although chatting to Dan a little bit earlier and things there we talked about ARI isn't really configuration as code but it's definitely this concept that we are using programming languages that we you know standard programming languages like JavaScript or Python or or whatever to configure and manage systems um, so that's a sort of hybrid of programmable communications with kind of a configuration as code. Um, the idea that you can you can set things up through JavaScript um, and also visual programming. And really, it's the visual programming piece that I'm going to talk on a little bit a little bit more in this talk because this is the thing that that I'm really into these days. Um, yeah, there, there's all kinds of talk. People talk about low, no code or low code um, and these kind of movements. Um, and for me, what's interesting is that. It's, it's opening up building and development to people who wouldn't normally consider themselves developers. People get very scared off by code, but actually when you give them something visual, they're a lot more kind of inclined to, to tinker and play around with things. So we're gonna go, um, yeah, we're gonna talk about visual programming um, and, and really what it is and why that's an interesting thing. And then hopefully I'll, uh, I'll bring the two parts together and you'll see where I'm going. So in the beginning, um, quick screenshot I, I copied from Vonage's uh, programmable Nexmo API docs, um, but this was what uh, asterisk configuration, well, still does look like really. That's, I think it's a PJSIP uh, compatible uh, endpoint piece of definition. But way we configure our, our asterisk PBX is we write a config file, or most people will write a config file with lots of values and, you know, um, then key value kind of pairs and, and setting. And it's not the most friendly. Um, 
it's not the easiest to discover things. Uh, you usually end up with the docs open in another window. Um, and, you know, you, you can't kind of visualize what the whole system looks like to get too easily. Um, it's great when you've got your config file written, but if you're just trying to figure out what you want to do, it's, you know, it's, it's not the most friendly, I think. Um, and then a few years ago, um, along came GUIs, um, specifically here, FreePBX, probably the most well-known kind of system on top of Asterisk to allow you to be a little bit more friendly in the way it allows you to configure your PBX. Um, realistically, though, this isn't, I wouldn't call the, these kind of GUIs a true visual environment. What we've got is we've got config files in an HTML style instead of a plain text file. We're still, um, you know, it's auto completing some things. There's lots more drop down menus and um, selectors, and it's a bit of color and a bit more layout and things. But you still kind of got to know what you're configuring where, um, and it, it doesn't it doesn't lend itself too well to kind of letting you visualize what the system looks like. It's just a potentially more friendly way of uh, of editing config files, and I believe you know ultimately it, it generates config on the back end anyway. So we have GUIs, um, and then of course we have now uh, code. So this is JavaScript. This is some of the AOI JavaScript um, examples. But you know, this is another way of managing your system. A um, little bit different. I know you know AOI isn't really about configuring asterisk. It's about building the applications yourself. But the principle here is that it, it's another way of setting up the way you want something to work. Um, in some ways, it's you know, is this more friendly than a GUI? Or is this more friendly than a config file? Um, I think the, the big thing is that obviously with a programming language, it's more familiar um, to a lot of people. So people are, you know, comfortable with JavaScript. They understand the syntax. They know what they're doing, or at least developers, people that can write JavaScript. Um, and, you know, the theory being there's a lot more JavaScript developers that are out there than there are asterisk admins. Um, so, you know, we have, uh, we have our code based ways of managing our, our PBX. But actually, this, this kind of leads me on to uh, the, the piece about visual programming now, really. Um, human language is visual. We are visual communicators as, as human beings. Um, this goes back to, you know, way back in the day, cavemen, cave paintings. We were showing things with pictures and explaining meanings and communicating information and ideas to other you know to other people and the idea here was shoot the elk or whatever it is and you know you might get some food rather than kind of details of how to configure your pbx but you know the same principle goes um we cavemen we have communicated visually they've left messages for each other they, they've shared things through pictures um, again we still do that today on an airplane um, for those of you that remember what these are like the uh, you know the safety card is full of a whole bunch of pictures and diagrams and it, it conveys things to you visually in steps with little little cartoons little symbols we kind of know that you know no smoking with a line through it and it's very international but it's also you know quite easy to digest and, and quite familiar if you were given a sort of long page of of text to read about the safety card for getting on the plane you probably wouldn't take it in certainly and this allows you to sort of jump around yeah text is great for reading linear kind of concepts a novel or something like that or a long story or an essay but you've really got to put a lot of mental uh, capacity into building up the narrative when something's visual it's far easier to kind of go back and move around and, and navigate a piece of information yeah. and you know this is how we we convey stuff ideas presentations marketing we do diagrams you know whiteboards i have my whiteboard on the wall in the office um, but you know, even though I work from home with nobody, I, I still have my, want to have myself a whiteboard and I have a fancy camera set up so I can share that whiteboard with people. But you know, people like to, to draw and to diagram especially. Blocks and lines are a very, very common way of communicating concepts, especially technical kind of flow concepts, that sort of thing. Um, and you know, ideas, ideas are visual. When things get complex, we reach for the whiteboard pen. Um, the, the best way we explain something to another person is to say, hang on, let's just let's just draw it out and I can I can show you. And often it's not just the finished picture that makes sense there. It's the process of going through of building up a drawing because you can start off with something and then you can build on it and build on it and build on it. And that's far easier. If you show somebody a complex diagram, you know, that you that you've spent an hour drawing and you ask them to look at it, they kind of go, whoa, how do I where do I start? Whereas if they see 
kind of if they build it up in in stages then it starts to make more sense because you can see what's connected to what and, and how things evolve so we have these ways of communicating information um, in diagrams but what about programming why are we still writing long lines of monospace text with you know semicolons and brackets and and complex syntax and things like that well actually we don't there are a lot of visual programming tools out there um, you know there are i'm not entirely sure what some of these are um, some of these slides are, are borrowed from a colleague's presentation um she did the research but uh, you know this idea of flow based programming um this one is blockly i believe um i think it's the um some iot stuff looks a bit like the uh blockly duino yes the arduino um hardware programming which is based on scratch uh, another one you know all kinds of these concepts here um anybody that's got kids um has probably seen scratch up in the top right there you know the way that we can kind of teach kids to build little games and things by by plugging together blocks of blocks on a gui um, and it gets these concepts over to them visual programming languages have been around for years you know it's 1960s so what's that 60 years now um it's not a new concept visual programming it's it's definitely a resurgence we're seeing more interest in visual programming um, and and people and again the tools have got maybe got more powerful i guess you know back in the 1960s the kind of machines that could, you couldn't really have drag and drop guis and an ability to to do complex flows like that but there were various tools that allowed you to sort of connect logical blocks together um, and so who uses these visual tools well you know most production developers as i would call them guys you know your, your standard javascript developers they, they maybe look down their nose at them a bit and go well i'm a i'm a developer code is my craft i write code but there are a lot of people out there who aren't developers um hobbyists people who are tinkering around with things um you know the non-developers kind of um people who just want to get stuff done so that's the the non-devs is the big interesting one the um the loco tools in business things like zapier or uh, ifttt for consumer use where people are creating their own workflows to, to solve their own problems um, we mentioned children you know doing things with scratch and also um sort of internet of things and hardware seems to be quite popular around kind of hardware control process automation and creating the back ends for connected devices um yeah i mean these, these people who are sort of hardware engineers and maybe can write embedded software but when they're trying to kind of they're not familiar with the tooling and the setup of servers and, and web services so there are visual tools that are coming out but but really to serve them specifically so we're seeing a lot of a lot of take up in that space um, and you know i think this, this cartoon is kind of good it's different different people have different skills and needs and ability you know so we need to recognize that some people want to write code and that's great and you know if you're a developer you're really fast in in writing code this isn't going to replace visual developments visual development tools are not going to replace code we're not going to see google you know the, the core google search engine being built in scratch or something um for one thing you know it it doesn't really um I wouldn't say it doesn't scale but it's not the most efficient when you're writing something that needs to be very very efficient very very low level and, and very reproducible and high value then you'll go down a layer but this is like what we've been doing for years with software. You know, we move up the stack. We started off with, with low level languages. We started off with assembly and machine code and things like that. And we, people created abstraction layers on top of that with, with higher level languages and, you know, third, third generation languages like Python and JavaScript. And really visual programming tools are just another generation, another layer on top of that. Most of them are using some kind of high level language about under the hood, um, generally Python or Node. Um, you know, which is then abstracted down through the layers to actually run on on the CPU itself. But you know, these are these are just human. This is evolution. This is stuff getting more accessible. So that leads me on to the thing I've been playing with: um, Node-RED and Asterisk. Um, so I've been tinkering with Asterisk for years. I certainly wouldn't call myself a, an expert in Asterisk by a long shot. Um, this was the first time I'd been looking at the the ARI or anything like that. Um, I had to ask Dan quite a few questions to understand uh, understand some of the things that were going on, um, but also the Node-RED uh, project. And I've been playing with Node-RED now for uh, probably getting on for the best part of two years, um, particularly you know in, in my day job and, and that kind of thing. So what is Node-RED? Um, Node-RED is a project that was born out of IBM. Um, these two gents here, Nick O'Leary and uh, Dave Conway Jones, work at, um, they still work at IBM, and they created Node-RED in 2013. 
Originally, it was created um, for their IoT kind of space. So it ties together with anybody that's used the MQTT protocol, um, message queue, tiny transport, I think it stands for. Um, that sort of, you know, sensors and, and information, and it was built as a tool to plumb together sensors into databases and web services and, and create a kind of back end for collecting data and controlling devices um, originally. Um, and it really has kind of evolved out of that a long way though. Um, so 2013, seven years now, um, it just went to 1.0 last uh, end of last year, I think, or beginning of this year. Uh, 1.1 has just come out as well. So it spent quite a lot of time in that kind of, the way node projects do, you know, a 0 11, 0 0.20 kind of releases um, because they were sort of figuring out the path and, and trying to get things um, locked down so they didn't, you know, they didn't have to worry about making breaking changes. But it is now a, a fairly mature product um, and it's it's kind of evolved its title as well. So it's now described as uh, flow-based uh, visual editor for flow-based programming. Um, it went through a few things. Originally, it was calling itself Internet of Things, but it, it really grew out of the Internet of Things space quite early on. Um, and is, is far broader, any web services, any APIs, all that kind of thing that you'd want to connect. Um, and it's also an open source project these days. So I said before it started off life inside IBM, um, but it's now uh, owned by the OpenJS Foundation, which went through like, through the JS Foundation. Um, and it's, so it's 100% open source. Um, Nick and Dave still work for IBM, so their salary is paid for by IBM. But uh, most of the time, you know, their, their day job is to work on Node-RED, so IBM, contribute it's ibm's contribution to the open source community um, so i like to think it's you know supported by ibm but not controlled by ibm um, it's 100 percent open source you can take it and and pretty much do anything you want with it um, and as i said it's flow-based programming so little diagram here these are this is kind of what node red flows would look like um, you can see we've got uh, this is a one I just threw together really for the graphic, but it kind of makes sense. Um, so you'd receive an HTTP request over on the side. Um, we go through that switch node where we kind of look at a decision point. So that's a bit like your if statements. Um, and then based on a value we'd inspect in the request, um, we might send it out of one of the different paths. So we might send it out of a path which just delays for five seconds and then sends the HTTP response back. Um, we set up a new message payload value. So it uses this message concept going through it, which I'll show you when we start diving into it. Uh, we make another HTTP request to an external web service and we then send back our response. Um, we do something with a template um, and we convert that templated data into JSON and we send that in the response um, or uh, we split the values out and log each one of those with that little green logging thing. So that really is a, a kind of nonsical uh, flow, but it's, um, it's one I created just for some uh, some graphics, but it does does at least vaguely make sense. So let's uh, let's go from here into our Node Red editor. Just make this a little bit bigger. Um, so this is the Node Red uh, dashboard. Sorry, Node Red Air editor not the dashboard. Um, this is your where you would build your flows. Um, so you have over here on the left hand side. Um, you have your palette, it's known with all your various standard nodes. And this is pretty much a, a stock install of Node-RED. Um, I haven't, I've installed one additional package, which I'll show you, but you can install, you know, just like any programming language, you can install lots of different packages. We can go down to manage palette and uh, we can search and bring in, I don't know, we could search for something to say Slack and bring in some Slack nodes or, or something like that, just like you would include packages. I mean, it's based on NPM under the hood, but obviously these are, and node red specific packages. Um, so, and the simplest thing is we drag on our nodes. So this would be a, an inject node. Um, let's just put a delay. So an inject node is like a manual way to, to send something in. Um, a delay node and a, a debug node is our equivalent of console log. Um, we can open it up and edit it. So we're gonna send our payload. Um, timestamp just allows you to use a, a value that, uh, that changes. Um, we'll go through that delay, we'll delay it by two seconds, and then we'll log it. Um, so I hit this deploy button, if I show my debugger there, it will run one, two, there we go, and it logs our, 
our timestamp. So, you know, that's kind of how we would build up our flows. Um, and you can actually do kind of, you can branch things off. So we might say, uh, send the timestamp, delay two seconds, uh, log it, and then delay two seconds and then log it again. Uh, I'm not quite sure why you want to do that, but you'll see the timestamp value will be the same, but the message will be sent once of now and once after two seconds. Um, so all pretty kind of simple stuff. But uh, so, you know, and I've been building quite a lot of things with this. I've built some stuff for our, um, our APIs at work. So we have all of the Nexmo APIs in Node-RED and you can control your, your programmable kind of comms APIs. But um, really that's still based on the idea of it's, it's, a, it's an HTTP API, it's request response, it's making REST calls and, and you know, just you're, you're, you've got the features that you would have in a normal programmable comms API. What about kind of actually mating Node-RED onto asterisk kind of in a, in, a, in a closely coupled thing such that the Node-RED editor becomes your asterisk config manager? Um, and you don't have any config files, and you don't have a GUI, you don't have FreePBX, you have Node-RED, and you can configure your, your PBX entirely in a visual manner. Um, so actually, we're almost going full circle back to the days of you know, the old analog PBXs where you physically wired each extension up and kind of screw, you know, screwed it into some screw terminals and set some dip switches or something to, to set an extension number and, and things like that. Um, so we we had this sort of visual. Would this be, you know, would this be actually a more friendly way? Um, but we still use Node Red, so you still have the capabilities to use the kind of logic functions of Node Red or templating and delays and even going out to to external services. So you've got kind of quite a lot of the, the power of, you know, configuration through code and programmable communications and, and building things with a programming language. Because really, you know, Node Red is a programming language, um, but also you've got that kind of visual idea of setting up asterisk. Um, so that's what I started working on. Um, I've got a few blocks here. These are the, uh, the AOI kind of based blocks. Um, and let's, uh, let's show you what we can do. So I've got a little, in fact, let's just log into it. And I need to make this font a bit bigger, aren't I? So you can see it on the screen. Let's just command. So I've got an asterisk install running. Oops, no, it's not running. Cool, that's good. So that's right. it up again. So I'll go into the CLI and we can just show you uh, pjsip show endpoints. And you can see, so I've got no endpoints configured. Um, it's, a, it's a completely empty asterisk. Um, I've got an AOI interface configured. Um, that's all really set up in here. Um, the kind of the IP address and the stuff you do out of the box, but there's no config. And I think there should be uh, the dial plan. Um, in fact, we've got so there's a little bit of something left over from uh, another one, but really there's this one dial plan here, um, context applications. Um, and all that does is sets stasis to a status application based on the caller ID. So that's it for my config. Um, there's, there's no dial plan. There's nothing um, that's just left in there as a, Cool. But, uh, so let's click it. So we have our empty asterisk. Um, so I'm going to create a couple of extensions. And so I use these little endpoint but that needs to be renamed from client to endpoint. And I can create, uh, I can go in, well, just edit the existing one, but we go in and tell it Node Red our config for our AOI interface. Um, so obviously, if you were doing this in a kind of closely coupled way, you could make this a default of, of they could run on the same machine and just connect to local host. Um, in this sense, I've just got Node Red running on a, a different VM um, to asterisk, just because one's on the development piece for developing the stuff. But uh, you know, we put up a URL for AOI, and I use name and password. So I've got my asterisk server, and I'm going to create some PJSIP clients. So I'm going to create one called 
100 as an extension. And we've got another extension called 200. We use the same asterisk instance. Very secure passwords. Don't try those at home. Uh, so there we've got our two uh, our two extensions. And actually, I should just be able to hit deploy, and it will say connected to AI. And now show endpoints. There we see. We can see. And in fact, something's actually registered with that. Um, <laughs> But uh, we've got our two endpoints uh, configured already on there. And I think my iPad is probably uh, been trying to register. I'm just going to do yes. Let's uh, forgot to disable that. Right. Uh, hopefully, I'll disappear in a bit. Um, so we've got our two endpoints configured. So that's how easy it is to provision an extension. Obviously, you know, at the moment, this is really early days. Um, we just set up our, our SIP credentials, really. Um, and uh, most of the other stuff is, is default. But yeah, you could imagine this becoming um, more options and, and things you might want to set on extensions um, from there. So what we want to do is we need some sort of dial plan. So whenever uh, either one of these makes a call, um, it will, uh, so originating calls from these extensions, will emit on this uh, this top node, this call node here. Um, at the moment, I'm kind of separating uh, events and calls coming out of the, the nodes and, and trying to figure out what that looks like. But uh, DTMF events um, would come out of there if, if they're not there. I'm trying to figure out how you handle DTMF and uh, kind of inline events. But so a call event would would emit. In fact, let's, uh, let's just put on that and put a debug on there message object and just see what happens when 100 makes a call so i've got a soft phone somewhere uh, yep that's 100 I'll bring that one online and let's say i dial 333 you should see yep in here what happens we don't have tech support that's because that's interesting why did that go through I thought I had that set to not flow. Always useful. Let's just take this out. Let's see what that does now. There we go. Um, I was picking up some old config that I thought if I disabled it, it wouldn't trigger. So I dial 333 and actually nothing really happens. It sits in calling, but we do get an event in our uh, node red flow here. So it emits a channel ID and uh, the payload just telling us some things about it. And again, some of this probably needs some rearranging, but we can see uh, the calling party, uh, the somewhere in the dial plan, it tells us what extension they've dialed, uh, extension 333. Um, and and so on. So there's, well, here's what happens when a call comes out. And we've just terminated that call. So what we want to do is, let's say we want to use the the number they dialed to create a dial plan. Um, so that at the moment is this value here, extension three three three. I can actually uh, copy the path to that. Let's get rid of that debug. And let's use a switch node as our dial plan. So the value we want to inspect is uh, payload channel dial plan extend at the moment. Again, this, this could, should probably be made clearer. Um, and it's a string. And we're going to say if the string uh, equals 200, uh, or if the string equals 333. And finally, we'll do another one, which is our catch-all, our kind of else. So we've got three potential outputs. Uh, they've dialed 100, they've dialed 333, or they've dialed something else. So we're going to say if 100, uh, and we can also hook this in for 200. And here are our outputs. So if they dial 200, 333, or otherwise. Um, so first of all, what do you want to do? Uh, we're going to capture the device. I know I'm going to regret this because no, I've just forgotten what the sound samples are. But uh, oh, we go. We can use weasels. Um, sound weasels even the phone system. Again, this would be uh, better if it can uh, can 
can uh, pull in from the API to look at what sound files are available. But let's do, uh, so let's just use this as an announcement. So if they dial an unknown number, uh, we're gonna play that and uh, then we can just hang up on them. So now we've got some handling for anything that isn't one of those numbers. We should be able to test that with uh, 500. Weasels have eaten our phone system. There we go. And uh, it plays weasels as our error announcement. Not quite sure why that didn't hang up. Interesting. So all very buggy at the moment. Um, but what if we want to actually uh, deliver a call somewhere? So, or for example, we want to play a message. Oops. That's really useful. Uh, so for 333, uh, we're going to answer the call and do a playback. So what you'll notice is that this um, this playback here uh, didn't answer send an answer because we currently have answer as a, an explicit event. Um, and our sound contact tech support. I never remember. I think it's that. Uh, yeah, it's contact technical support. Going to add a little delay on the end. We can again we can combine this we saw before with all of the default asterisk nodes and hang up our call. We'll be doing this on a small screen here and a new uh, space. So that should be three three three. There we go. Please contact technical support. So you see there, it actually answered the call. Um, it's going to delay for five seconds. So you can see the blue dot where it is on the uh, on the call going through. Why that one's hung? But uh, and after about five seconds, it should. Yeah, that's interesting. Playback isn't uh, isn't emitting out of it. Anyway, um, and of course the other thing we can do though is we can connect on to other uh, extensions. So we've got our bridge dial node, um, and we can say at the moment. Uh, again, ideally, this would be another kind of node that you can show if you just want to send it to a um, to an endpoint. You would you would wire it to another corresponding node, a bit like the, the grey ones. But if they dialed uh, two hundred, we're going to send it to a bridge dial. But two hundred, you could you know, template this to uh, send stuff through. But uh, and we need to tell it at the moment to answer. This uh, uh, needs to be built in, but we've now got our EVX set up. So if I just set this one up as a as 200 and I'm registered, cool. so I've got Bria running on my iPad. Uh, so from 100 here, I can dial 200, and I think there we go. Anonymous. I don't know why the uh, the ringtone isn't working on Bria, but hopefully you can see that that is ringing. And if I answer, we'll get lots of feedback. So we've got our PBX bridging our calls that way. Uh, again, I need to handle the hang up. But th this is the kind of concept of configuring um, configuring your PBX um, and your dial plans by by arranging blocks as to what you want to happen. Um, and you know, you, you would use things like, you wouldn't obviously worry with every individual extension that somebody had dialed. You do your logical stuff like setting up a range of numbers and saying, okay, all my, you know, 100 through to, to 200, um, because in this switch, we can actually say, you know, greater than, less than, um, that kind of thing. So we can, we can apply um, sort of rules, regexes or, you know, not equal to, and, and that kind of any any logic you'd imagine, um, and you would just pass uh, pass that to a bridge dial, which would pick up the value of dialed. So if they they've dialed, if all your extensions are kind of below one thousand, if they've dialed a number below one thousand, just bridge dial it. If they dial the number, you know, a pattern that starts with a zero, you send it out down a SIP trunk or or whatever. Um, again, if you want to have your your kind of you can build your basic applications. Um, your IVRs. So as I said, if uh, let's see, we can do DTMF stuff. So DTMF is currently emitted off of here, I believe. Um, so that's on that one. Deploy that. Um, 
we'll just use 500. We don't have tech support. And I think we won't get TTMF if it hasn't answered, of course. All right, let's do it on 333. We don't have tech support. I didn't let the one trigger today. I should have gone to an answer. That's strange. Anyway, always the risk of a live demo. Um, and like I say, this is, you know, this is really early days, but the idea would be to have a, a whole bunch of, of nodes um, that could recreate asterisk. Now, obviously, you know, AOI is a, is a lower level, raw um, control there. So we actually need to, or I need to <laughs> say, we would need to rebuild uh, the functionality of a standard PBX in many ways um, into these nodes. But I think, you know, we talk about endpoints, we have playbacks, we have hangups, we have answers, we have dial, um, you know, we, we maybe how we do voicemail. Um, maybe you have a node that's just, you know, send the call to voicemail. Um, and we try and trying to reuse as many of the built in node red sort of primitives as we can. So things like the switch node, um, or you know the delay nodes and and things like that templating. Um, I think there's some stuff here, you know, root by exception, where you can can kind of use it to rate limit stuff. Um, firing off you know external web web requests, uh, TCP requests, anything like that. Um, and even you know Node-RED has a has a dashboard component, so you can create like visual displays and and that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, so that's uh, that's really the idea. Um, so I say I'm uh, I'm Sam Machin. I'm my GitHub and everything is. I'm sure Dan will put this up in the lower third, but uh, my GitHub is just at Sam uh, Sam Machin on GitHub, and I believe I'm just going to check if it's there or not. Yeah. Uh, so the project is there on GitHub. Um, it might be a slightly older version. Um, but you know, feel free to to put an issue on there. Again, I'm at Sam Machin on Twitter. Um, you know, join the discussion after this. Tell me what you think. Tell me if it's interesting, and uh, let's uh, let's see what happens. Cool. Thanks very much. Thanks, Sam. Um, I don't think. I, how can I say this? Um, this this shows the power of visual programming to me, like. Um, the, the fact that you can connect to something as complex as asterisk and visually say, right, when we get a call in on 200 or a range of numbers or whatever, for us to be able to go and say, okay, I want to place these into a queue or, or a queue that we make ourselves within ARI because um, part of the primitive of, of ARI is that there is no queuing anymore. Asterisk has this yeah. concept of a queue, but but um, we're not using asterisk queues anymore. We're building it ourselves. So the fact that we could even make a queue, the logic for that queue within Node-RED itself, and then when you get to the other end of the queue, for us to then pick it up again and do something in asterisk is hugely powerful. Um, and Absolutely, yeah. I think, I mean, the, the idea was, you know, yeah, a queue, yeah. queue, I forgot to mention, a queue node is definitely one that, you know, we want to have because, you can see the little blue dots and actually you could even you know use this as your real-time status to see how many calls are in the queue because you, know, you just have your your blocks as queues and calls go in and you do something to kick another call out of the queue or you know you, you have yeah to send at, a queue call in the, and then send a take in or whatever at the beginning of um ari we, we were actually talking about like rewriting functions that were available in asterisk um, as as ARI functions or whatever within like JavaScript or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then as time went on, we said, well, that's not really true. Like you wouldn't just bring in a queue application from NPM, for example, um, because the queue is say, if you're writing something with ARI, the queue would be um, unique to your company, right? But this is actually, you know, you, you asked me earlier whether or not ARI could be described as config as code and i and i just replied mm. with no because like it, it's it's different it is actually an application but for what you're actually trying to do within node red it is like if we re if yeah. we made yeah, like, if, if we made replacements for the queuing um stuff within asterisk um and all of the other functions that are available to you in the asterisk style plan then it absolutely is configuration as code 
Um, okay. I don't want to. I, I'm, I'm I'm excited about this. Um, it, it's a really really cool. neat thing. <laughs> um, so I won't I won't um, I won't answer, ask too many questions now because um, that's the Q and A. Um, and <laughs> yeah, we'll save that I, for the Q and A. Yeah, it's it, it's a really cool concept um, and something that I've, I, I I hadn't really thought about until I saw you talking about it at Tad Hack, um, and it's really really neat. Hmm. I think it's it's you know it's really interesting, and if you look at the a lot of the typical asterisk users, the kind of small business, they want to have a PBX, they want to manage their own system, um, but you know they're they're getting lost in config files. We can we can kind of marry marry the you know the power of configure you know of, of proper low level kind of code based configuration um, with the idea of you know an application to configure it. Yeah, uh, you know it's really that idea that we can make something friendly and and accessible, but also powerful with, with visual programming. And I think that's something that we need in, in PBX configuration and in all sorts of tools for users. Absolutely. I mean, so let's go over to, uh, let's go over to Riot. Um, so riot.comcon.xyz, um, the link will be in the description below, um, where you can ask Sam um, any of your questions. Um, we'll be over there and then we'll do a live Q&A. Um, that's it. Um, I'll cool. see you in a minute over on Riot, and so will Sam. Don't go anywhere qu quite yet, though. We've got to say thank you to all of our sponsors. With Without them, none of this would have even happened in the first place. So for our Platinum sponsors, we've got Tulu, Voxbone, and Ciara. For our Gold sponsors, we've got the Matrix Foundation, Vonage, Sangoma, Telviva, and Lowe. Our silver sponsors are Aptose, Pion, Telco Bridges with Pro SVC, Avoxy, 8x8 with Jitsi, and Firstcom Europe. And we've also got community sponsors, QXIP and Cycle Systems. Without any of them, this would never have even happened. You wouldn't have had all of this free content on YouTube. So go say thank you to all of them. Go look at what they provide, what services they offer. Um, and have a have a conversation with them all um, over on Riot, riot.comcon.xyz. The link will be in the description below, along with links to all of our sponsors. You can go and watch um, preview videos from all of our gold sponsors right now over on YouTube. The links will be somewhere over here. Um, all I've got to say is thank you to all of our sponsors. Um, and I'll see you over on the Q&A shortly. Cheers.